paintings um, by abstract expressionist Mark Rothko were painted in New Orleans in March of 1957 when he was invited here to visit Tulane by Professor Pat Trevino. On the left is White and Greens in Blue, formerly in the Nelson Rockefeller Collection and today in the collection of Mrs. Paul Mellon. And on the right, Red, White and Brown, today in the Kunst Museum in Basel. For any of you who are unfamiliar with Rothko, he looms large in the history of 20th century art for his so-called color field paintings, planes of vivid color that became his unmistakable trademark. In fact, these two works were painted in a makeshift studio in Ida Kohlmeyer's mother's garage in Old Metairie, and using supplies that Rothko purchased on Magazine Street with the help of a Tulane graduate assistant named Kendall Shaw. Um, so, in these two photographs, um, Rothko actually appears at the lower right um, in the Life magazine photo on the right. Um, that is a portrait of the so-called Irascible 18, a group of artists to challenge the Metropolitan Museum in a famous letter written by artist Adolf Gottlieb, which called for the inclusion of modern abstract painting in a 1950 exhibition. By the time of the visit to Tulane in 1957, Rothko, who was born in 1903, was a mature artist, um, albeit generally unrecognized. His rectangular fields of color brought him fame not long after his stay in New Orleans, with a landmark exhibition at Sidney Janis Gallery in New York. So I initially learned of Rothko's month-long stay in New Orleans as an undergraduate at the University of New Orleans, um, and that's where I read this biography by James Breslin, shown at the right. <clears throat> Professor Trevino, shown at the left, who invited Rothko to Tulane, was himself originally from New York, and he went there to interview five or six artists and chose Rothko from among them. Trevino made arrangements for the Be Betty Parsons, or possibly the Sidney Janis Gallery, to ship several of Rothko's paintings to New Orleans to display in the new Gamart department. So Trevino's role in bringing Rothko was very important. So as an undergraduate, again, I became very interested in all of this. Um, and in 1997, and also in 2003, I interviewed Trevino, Ida Kohlmeyer, and Kendall Shaw, the graduate assistant at Tulane that I mentioned earlier. Um, who did become a professional artist, and he still lives, um, he now lives in Brooklyn. Um, Rothko, you know, encountered Trevi um, Kendall Shaw at Tulane and encouraged him to um, go to New York, which uh, Shaw did. So that's um, Trevino's painting on the left. It's called Taro Comechia, um, Taro Mechia, um, of 1952. And of course, Trevino on the right um, at work in the Nuka Art Department. So when I first visited Trevino, um, he shared his memories of Rothko with me, um, and he also brought out several photographs to my surprise and delight, um, and so uh, that included the one on the left showing Rothko. We don't, we're not sure where he was in this picture. He may have been at a, a party or maybe at Trevino's house because he stayed with Trevino for a while before moving into Ida Kohlmeyer's mother's home. And so here we see Rothko with his arms around his wife Mel on the left and Pat Trevino's wife Helen on the right. Um, and that photograph um, has these ballpoint pen marks on it, um, which I think may have been added by Pat, uh, cropping the photograph maybe to produce a portrait um, after it. Um, or um, it may be that they were added um, when the photographs were sent to the Guggenheim Museum, which did a retrospective on Rothko. And Trevino sent the photographs there um, they ended up not being published in the Guggenheim catalog, but it looks like they may have been planning to do so. So we don't know. But um, when I saw this photograph, I wondered, well, where are they in it? Um, and so last year, um, I, you know, as I was preparing the article, I thought, wait a minute, that gallery railing looks very distinctive. Uh, so I started looking through books of plantation houses, and then it hit me that San Francisco plantation that they're standing in front of. And so you can see on the left, up in the upper left hand corner, the very distinctive railing, and on the right, you know, a detail of it, um, and also what it looks like from afar. And there was a third photograph that uh, Trevino had, um, which shows the Trevino children uh, with Kate Rothko in the center, Rothko's daughter, who the Rothkos also brought to New Orleans. 
So these photographs provide some wonderful uh, visual evidence of Rothko's uh, visit that had, have never been published before until their, their appearance in cultural distance. So for the Breslin biography that I showed before, this letter written by Rothko to his friends, the Ferbers, um, and now the Smithsonian Archives of American Art, provided good evidence. But details of Rothko's Tulane colleagues, uh, their memories were left out of the biography. So I tried to bring that information forward in the article. Things like Rothko's visit to the Gulf Coast with Trevino, his visit to the French Quarter, um, with fellow artist Theodore Ostamos, who was in town for a lecture, and also Rothko's great interest in jazz um, and his visits to the Lufjans Jazz Club with Kendall Shaw. So I, of course, can't read this whole letter to you now. We don't have time, but um, just a snippet. Rothko writes, quote, we get to the French Quarter, which is in part like a miniature section of Paris with its intense charm of scale and affords all the pleasure of walking and browsing around it. We also had a glimpse of plantation country. People are kind and gracious. So, you know, the interviews with Trevino and Shaw, um, Rothko had a tendency to express, um, we learned that Rothko was a bit frustrated with some of the graduate students at Tulane who weren't very serious about art in the way that he was. Um, so there's this sort of idea that's been out there that Rothko was not happy in New Orleans, but when you really listen to the things that Trevino and, and Shaw say in their interviews, um, uh, especially um, Kendall Shaw talking about Rothko and you know going around New Orleans and going to the jazz clubs. He really did enjoy his visit here, and I think he, he um, you know felt that it was a very worthwhile thing. Um, so on the right, an image of uh, Lufjan's Jazz Club, which Rothko frequented, and on the left, a Nola Rockamore portrait of Billy and Dee Dee Pierce, who were the house band of the club originally on Franklin Avenue um, and later in the quarter. Um, and so we do know that Rothko heard them play when he was here. So most important, the most important part of the story um, is uh, about Rothko in New Orleans. Many of the details I have to leave out tonight because there is a time, but the most important thing to know about it is that uh, Rothko deeply influenced the graduate, some of the graduate students that he encountered at Tulane, uh, particularly Ida Kohlmeier and Kendall. Um, so this is a photograph of Ida at Newcomb in about 1963 during the phase in which she uh, produced a lot of works that were basically almost copying Rothko. Um, she just encountered him and it really changed her way of, of doing art. Um, she, um, you know, sort of became an abstractionist um, under the influence of Hans Hoffmann and Mark Rothko. And of course, um, his influence was keenly felt by Kendall Shaw. On the left is Kendall and his wife, Frances. Um, and then the large photograph in the background, um, in the 1960s, um, Charles Colbert of the New Orleans architecture firm of Colbert Lowry became dean of the Columbia School of Architecture, and Colbert hired Kendall to teach, and he's shown here. This is Kendall in his um, Avery Hall studio, and he's holding a, basically a house painter's paintbrush, because that's what they would use. They used house paint and house painter's brushes to produce these giant works of art. So, a lot of my research is on, you know, my findings are on video because I interviewed these guys and videotaped them. So I thought I would actually let them speak tonight um, and tell you what they knew about Mark Rothko. So this is Kendall Shaw. The, the question of his staying at Ida's mother's was important because I had a car and uh, could take him around back and forth. And in fact, uh, Francis' mother babysat for Kate at one point. Mm -hmm. uh, as Mel was there, I don't know what was happening with mm -hmm. the babysitting thing, you know. But um, that got, I was able to meet him, mm -hmm. and, you know, uh, be with him a lot more. Mm -hmm. And uh, they had a wonderful trip. He wanted to buy some paint. And we wanted to. Uh, Art paint store on Magazine Street by the canal, the biggest in the city. He wanted, he wanted tinting colors, Benjamin Moore. And I said, Mark, you want tinting colors? I mean, come on, you want good quality oil paint. No, can ultramarine blue is made by the same, the same factory, 
Everybody that makes paint buys the same stuff. You have to be a bit of a bum in this racket. And uh, I said, what about the oil? Forget the oil. No, anyway, uh, so we went to the, we bought some tinted colors, which I had until I moved here two years ago. Um, and I decided, well, I'm really not using them. I put them out on the sidewalk and so on. Uh, I met him when, I, when he arrived in New Orleans. I picked him up at the train station. He didn't fly. So he came in the uh, canal and the river where the old southerner used to come. I guess maybe it still does. I don't know. Sort of. Mm -hmm. he, and he came in uh, there and I met him. Took him over out to the campus. Uh, we had three. So you went straight from the, from the station to the station. Right, to the school. And I was going to pick him up at the school to take him to our mother's. Uh, I introduced him to uh, Alfred Boyer, who was head of the art department then. Uh, Alfred's now out in uh, Santa Barbara. But, uh, and Rothko immediately attacked him. The, because I said, oh, this is Alfred. And I like Alfred very much. And he was a very sympathetic art historian to, to, to contemporary art. But although he was, uh, he was his specialty was the followers of Caravaggio. Yeah. But he said, uh, and Mark met him, I said, He's, this is Alfred, Alfred ahead of our people. Why don't, you, why don't you quit? Why don't you give your place to an artist? You are historians. Uh, you know, take take all these teaching positions. You should. Uh, it's artists who make art. Art historians don't make art. Why don't you quit? And Alfred said, "Oh, I, I love contemporary art." And uh, he said, "We, you, you guys, you know, he put him down." He said, "If we were waiting for Cezanne uh, to be discovered by you guys, it wouldn't have happened." It took Brock and Picasso to discover Cezanne. Uh, and then he charges into the building. <laughs> Alfred with his mouth open. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. What a great story. So what was your general impression of him then? That he was very more uh, bravado? Before he came down, he shipped three paintings. Three, maybe it was two. I had to hang them. Somebody else made frames, they came a little bit. We sent down three paintings on a condition that they wouldn't... Oops, let me just... And that they would be... We sent down three paintings on a condition that they wouldn't be shown to the general public and that they would be you know, in a place where only the graduate students and faculty could see them. So, and there were big paintings rolled up. So one of the other graduate students stretched them, built, built, built stretches, he sent the sizes, and stretched them. But I, I, I was in charge of the gallery actually at, the time, at that time. That is, the, the student work at the gallery, the hanging of the shows, the nailing, putting the nails in the wall, and, so, uh, and which was wonderful because it gave me a chance to sit. There was a butterfly, canvas butterfly chair there. We sat very low, so I was in a tiny, tiny room, and we had to drape a cloth over the door to that part of the gallery. There was no door in that part of the gallery, so we, it was a little room off to the side. So it, we to make it private because he didn't want his painting shown to the public at large. Uh, I, you know, I, I could sit in there, and I literally sat in there after I installed it. I sat there for hours uh, looking at these works. And I did, they were, it was a new idea of painting. I was, I come out of the Stuart Davis idea of uh, the choreography across the canvas and so forth and the, uh, the way the eye travels across the canvas in all shapes positive. Suddenly there are canvases with practically no shapes. 
and with great fields of color that would just come out and sit on your shoulder and, you know, warm you uh, or cool you, the blues would come out. And these colors, the colors were, were doing this after you sat for a while. And it really required exactly that, to sit for a while and, and feel what these colors were doing because of this, the space that the various colors made, dark colors going back, generally speaking, but not necessarily, and the, and the, uh, the more intense colors coming forward. And so, and, uh, um, and so uh, I think I got it. And before I met him, it was like, hey, this makes sense. I understand this painting. So when I met him, I met him with great uh, not because he had a name, because he didn't have a name about it. He was one of the abstract expressionists, but they were not that um, later. They were more mm -hmm. So I have one more clip, um, and this is Pat Trevino. And by the way, Pat and Kendall were both sitting in front of their own paintings. Um, I don't know the name of the painting Kendall was sitting in front of. Um, but this is uh, Trevino in front of his murals that he did for the sports arena um, in, here in New Orleans. He was working on them at the time, and this was in 2002. Um, but he was a little hard, that way. In other words, if there was some wrong, he made it ten times worse. So you couldn't really take that too seriously? Well, I didn't know him that well at the uh, time, you know. Uh, I took it seriously. Uh, well, I knew what he was trying to say, too. Uh, at the time, when these women were there, you know, they were, frankly, just, uh, you know, they might have played for a semester. Left him. And but some were very serious. You know. I mean, he was coming from such an intense art scene. He came from a scene. different, uh, different yeah, world. He knew uh, more key and, and then, you know, we had Mardi Gras here and that all stuff started appealing to him a little bit. Really? Did he see that? Did he see Mardi Gras? Yeah, we saw Mardi Gras. Amazing. Yeah. Yeah. And, he was a, and then, of course, his daughter was having a great time. Uh -huh. uh, my son and daughter. But it was a very mixed reaction. You know, to hear him tell about this awful house and that um, mm -hmm. it wasn't an awful house. It was a very nice house. <laughs> it was a very nice house. Um, yes, and he used the garage. Well, that's not really nice. Some of this information is of importance to you. Know, well, it is. It's the story of his visit here. Isn't yeah. that? It's interesting to me. So he used the garage by the home Yeah, he worked in a garage the there. And, uh, Did you see him working there? Well, I would like go, you know, I would go pick him up to bring him around because he didn't have a car. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, I would walk in while he was working, but I never actually. Well, that story that comes to my mind, which is personal, mm -hmm. my uh, wife at the time used to make fun of me because mm -hmm. I take a long time to do a painting. Mm -hmm. And he would just do a painting in a day or two. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And she said, he can do a painting in a day or two. Uh -huh. Big paintings that you work and you work and you work. Uh -huh. and, you know, that was kind of a joke. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, color field painting. Well, you know, I don't want to get into that, but I just remember being ridden by my wife. Thank you so much. So, so in terms of he completed two canvases while he was in the yeah, yeah. Oh, and then another thing is, uh, you know, he would do the art with dark paints. Right, right. And all those guys at that period really didn't care about craft at all. <laughs> and some of these household paints might be okay, but you know, paint pictures and then sell them for thousands of dollars. <laughs> And that was a, you know, kind of a moral thing that bothered a lot of people. They always spoke of his paintings in reference to specific people. He did? Yeah. That was right. Well, like he said, the painting I did now was my wife. Really? And then he would, he would be driving in the car and he said, the painting I'm doing now is your wife. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, he just took that and accepted that something, something transpired in his mind and made the connection. Mm -hmm. But obviously there was no connection that anyone could ever see. But he obviously saw me from that. He only alluded to that experience like that. Okay. So.